everybody. Um, we have, I say this a lot, but today is a really, really special treat for you. I'm live with Dr. Richard Horowitz, and I'm going to introduce him in just a minute, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, and then we're going to dive into a fascinating topic um, and one that you may or may not know a lot about, but hopefully by the end of this um, 45 minutes to an hour, you will uh, learn more and have some more information just to help um, in the plight that we are facing. Um, just a little housekeeping. If you want to find any uh, resources, you can go to my website, jillcarnahan.com. Um, you can watch this live and share it on Facebook. It will also be on my iTunes channel and uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And then also on my YouTube channel, you can watch the video. So those are places if you want to share this content later, um, it will be up and live in uh, just a few days. Uh, the other thing is if you uh, need to find any products, you can find those at drjillhealth.com. So I am so excited. Uh, we were just talking beforehand how, you know, you've heard me talk a lot on these interviews and a lot of these interviews with, you know, this analytical science-based medicine that we all learned and practice and really, you know, it's a great foundation. Um, I love our allopathic model because we do have good science. But a lot of times when we get really difficult situations in life or in medicine or with patients, um, I told Dr. Horowitz, you know, I, I saw you and saw what you were doing, and I recognized a similar heart in the sense of we both learned to incorporate both the right and left brain, the head and the heart. And sometimes I know he'll agree, my most profound wisdom and ability to solve medical complexities comes from this heart intuitive space. And we recognized each other in that realm right away because. Um, I know some brilliant analytical doctors and I know some brilliant heart-based doctors, but when you can combine these two energies and go with an open mind, um, it's amazing the kinds of solutions that we can come up with. And today I want to uh, really, really emphasize solutions because what we're talking about, which is climate change, is a really overwhelming topic for a lot of people. Um, let me introduce you, Dr. Horowitz, and then we will dive right in. Dr. Horowitz is a board-certified internist and the medical director at Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, an integrative medical center, which combines both classical and complementary approaches in the treatment of Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. You may know Dr. Horowitz as an expert in Lyme disease and uh, tick-borne illnesses. Um, I actually went to his clinic to learn from him. I respect, I literally tell my patients he is um, one of the world leaders in this, and I respect him so much. He's written multiple books before about this topic. Um, he's treated over 13,000 Lyme and tick-borne disease patients in the last 30 years. Patients all over the US, Canada, and Europe come to his clinic. Um, he is assistant director of medicine at Vassar Brothers Hospital. Um, and I never say this right, but <laughs> your, your city there, uh, uh, Poughkeepsie. Thank you. <laughs> Every time I still can't get it right. Poughkeepsie, <laughs> New York, and one of the founding members and past presidents of ILEDS, which is one of our medical organizations that teaches um, doctors about Lyme. Um, he has done, he's been president of other organizations and written books that one of the most um, well-known ones with patients and doctors alike is Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Disease. And then how can I get better an action plan for treating resistant Lyme and chronic disease? These two have been really game changers for my patients in understanding Lyme disease. And really what he's written is a lot of just protocols over the science that he's learned in how to do this. Um, and I think we're going to probably talk today about how these relate to climate change, because I'm, I'm sure that there is a connection there that we'll want to discuss. Um, he has published multiple scientific articles and integrative solutions for COVID recently, which has been, um, again, no surprise because these infections are part of our climate change. They're part of the environment we live in. Um, I could read uh, a little bit more, but I wanna get to our talk, Dr. Horowitz. Thank you, um, first of all, just for your time to join us. I am always honored to have time with you. Oh, Jill, to have, spend time with a sister like you is a great joy for me too. So uh, I'm really happy to be with you. Thank you. So climate change, this is, this is a new topic for you, but so, so relevant. And I love to start with story. So tell us, how did you get interested in really making a change in this area? And um, what do you see as some of the driving forces behind why we need to start talking about this? So, you know, we know from the point of view of Lyme, because obviously I've been doing Lyme and Tickborn now for uh, mm -hmm. almost 35 years, that the Lyme infections keep getting worse every year, right? I mean, if you go back 10 years, the CDC was saying, oh, it's 30,000, right, a year, but multiply it by tenfold because, you know, we're underestimating. Yeah. And then this past year, you know, 
fast forward 10 years, it's almost a half a million cases. And that's the diagnosed cases. Mm -hmm. That does not include the 5% of the US population that has chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, right? Which mm -hmm. is of chronic fatiguing, musculoskeletal, <laughs> cognitive illness with POTS and neuropathy. So it's like, hmm, I wonder how many of those have Lyme disease. And then you throw in, you know, 20 to 25 million autoimmune illnesses in the United States, which Lyme causes autoimmunity on top of environmental toxins, right? Yeah. Um, and then you look at 46.5 million Americans with dementia, right? A really yeah. high number. And spirochetes are now showing up in the brain, Judith mm -hmm. McClossey, Alan McDonald, these spirochetes are showing up in a lot of different ways in these medical illnesses, and they've been shown it keeps getting worse year after year. And the question, of course, is why? Like, why does this keep spreading? Is it just the birds are going from, you know, country to country, state to state? And yes, it's part of it. And of course, we got new ticks, right? The Lone Star tick is now all the way up the East Coast. We've got an alpha gal allergy in Long Island all the way up to Maine. Um, we've seen the Asian bush tick, Camophilus, right? That Now that's spreading. They found their first Lyme organism, by the way, in there, but not transmissible, it doesn't look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's been getting worse every year. And when I started looking at the literature on climate change, it was like for every small degree in temperature, mm -hmm. these insects are able to reproduce much quicker. Wow. So you're, you're talking about already, we've gone in 10 years from 30,000, 300,000 to 500. Mm -hmm. The climate, as it gets warmer, and you know, to be clear, when we're talking about this from pre-industrial levels in the 1800s, we're 1.1, maybe 1.2, depending on what you read, centigrade higher than the 1800s. But in the Arctic, it's already two to three degrees. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're trying to keep down this this rise in temperature because we know at a certain point, it's going to start to melt in Greenland and Antarctica, and we're going to get sea level rise. And it's already happened. I don't I th think people know, but you may not know it's already one foot higher mm -hmm. than it was from 100 years ago. So it's already happening, but it's so slow. Most mm -hmm. people don't notice it. But you know, most people are focusing on the water levels coming up. And everyone, by the way, who I've spoken to in the climate does not believe that Miami will survive in the year 2050. Um, Miami is absolutely a ground level. And, um, you know, the dolphin fans are going to have no lands yes. uh, come, come in about 30 years. Uh, they, they'd be playing partially underwater. Yeah. So unless we do something radical, and most of the climate scientists are saying we have about eight or 10 years maximum yeah. to turn this around, we are looking at the greatest existential threat, the greatest humanitarian threat that we have ever, ever faced mm -hmm. and when i was you know three years ago when uh, the last administration was in you know in the white house and they were kind of denying climate change you know i'm all over the medical literature i'm reading stuff all over the place and i started reading on the climate and i really got concerned you, you know you're talking about being in the heart yeah. i started crying yeah. i was looking at the science reading the science in nature in a lot of magazines going Oh my God, you know, the, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, like the Gulf Stream that controls weather, starting to slow down, mm -hmm. right? Because of the changes in temperature. Yeah. If that thing slows down, this is like the day after tomorrow, the movie yeah. where, you know, the Northeast, all of a sudden you've got ice age. You, it's a complete global mm -hmm. disaster. And they're already showing the AMOC is slowing down. The carbon dioxide rates, you know, 350.org, the reason when Bill McKibble Findit, uh, initially started this organization, that was where we were, you know, a couple of hundred yeah. years ago. It, in Hawaii recently, they had measured 420, 421. Now to be clear, the last time the planet had 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide was the Pliocene era wow. millions of years ago. Would you like to know how much higher the seas were the last yeah. time we were at 420? anywhere between 40 to 80 feet higher wow. than they are right now. That is New York City underwater, most major coastal cities under. So let's be clear. This is what the carbon dioxide level. So you want to play with humanity's future knowing that the AMOC is slowing down. We've got enough carbon dioxide now that we're seeing. It was just a couple of months ago, there was a major melt in Greenland where the amount of water that went into the ocean would have raised Florida's levels that would have been two inches across the entire state of Florida. Wow. So we're in this transition phase, but what I don't think most people realize is that by 2050, they just reported this, by the way, last week, there's 150 species going extinct every day 
Yeah. They're expecting that 25 to 33 percent of all of the species on this planet will be extinct. Uh -huh. They just recently gave a list of 20 species, including a woodpecker. Uh, you may have, you may have seen this that went extinct. But part of this is the bees and pollinators. Well, that's what I was going to say. What people don't realize is this affects our food supply and our health and our ability to get good food and to even sustain life with that food. People might think, oh, extinction doesn't really affect me. I think that's the biggest um, reason why people don't act or change their behaviors is because they don't realize how directly this impacts us, each one of us, right? Right. And, and all you do is look at California now with the drought. Yeah. Look at Arizona, look at Colorado. Yeah. I mean, look at these states. Even Colorado this year, all summer in the 90s, we've never had right? something like this. The so. almond I eat almond butter yeah. just about every day, right? For my hypoglycemia right. and the rest. Right. The almond farms took a hit. They, they can't yeah. produce the food in California. So this is the early stages. Yeah. This is at 1.1. Now, mm -hmm. for this COP26 summit in Glasgow, they're saying, let's keep it to 1.5. Well, mm -hmm. let's be clear. Yeah. What has happened in the last year or two Look at the flooding in Germany. Mm -hmm. Look at the flooding in China in the subways. Look at the flooding in New York City in the subways. Mm -hmm. Look at the people who died in basements yeah. in Queens during these flooding, right? We're talking already with the storms, with the hurricanes. Every one time we get one of these storms and you get the storm surges, yeah. you're talking about like massive damage to the homes with mold. Yeah. Who, That's who's the other thing. I see it just from, that pers just from that perspective, which is like this much, it's huge, the amount of, the south and then the now the east coast are uh, going to be full of mold and then so, as we have the the electromagnetic radiation environment it makes the mold more aggressive and all of these things play onto one another so yeah. you know we're but between the droughts or too much water right in certain areas yeah. or the hurricanes that have now increased in intensity because the warmer water and the warmer right. air that warmer water has more energy mm -hmm. right so it's fueling level four, level five hurricanes, yeah. right? So you're talking about more destruction mm -hmm. and they're trying to say, well, we don't have the money at this point, you know, to do anything except Bill Gates and foundations and many people have run the numbers. Mm -hmm. Economically, you're gonna save seven to 10 times as much mm -hmm. fixing the problem now than yeah. trying to repair the damage afterwards. Yeah. So it, it just makes complete sense to invest in the money and this kind of political dysfunction that exists in our Congress. You know, mm -hmm. we're the greatest democracy in the world, but we're a democratic experiment. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get both sides to come together and say, listen, you may have your opinions on right. abortion, on whatever it is you have, but climate change is going to affect everyone. There's no one that's going to yeah. be an exemption to this. This is kind of going to be a real experiment to see. And we talked earlier about the heart. Yeah. You can't just be thinking about your political career and how I'm going to be elected next time and the, right. you know, the super PACs that are giving me money because I'm going with big oil. Big oil is still putting, they're pulling oil out of the ground and they put disinformation campaigns in place mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. right? So do we have solutions? We do. In fact, Elon Musk, years ago, mm -hmm. he did the calculations. Did you know in the United States, if you take 100 by 100 square miles in California, Nevada desert, Arizona, 100 by 100 square miles with solar panels, mm -hmm. you could give the entire United States enough energy to get off fossil fuels? Wow, no, but that's- 100 by 100 square mile. If you go to the yeah. Sahara, the Great Saharan Desert, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is millions and millions right. of square right. miles. If you take 1%, a little more than 1% of the Sahara Desert that has sun 13 hours a day, mm -hmm. and you put solar panels with present efficiencies, you can get, give enough, energy for the entire world wow. 17.4 terawatts of energy for the entire world to get off fossil fuels wow so it's not the solutions don't exist yeah right it's the problem right now with the world leaders coming together and realizing that we're really in big trouble and we've got a short period of time now so years ago when i was looking at this and I was telling you this story a little bit earlier, and I'll, I'll tell the story because I don't think most people know it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been meditating for over 40 years. I started studying with Tibetan Buddhist lamas in, in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And I, you maybe have heard me tell this story that my last year in medical school, I went to Lama Gendon Rinpoche, who's my teacher who gave me refuge. And I said, Lama, I'm about to become a doctor. Yeah. What do you want me to know? Like, what's the most important thing you want me to know? And he said, Richard, the most important thing is compassion. Oh. Put yourself in people's shoes. Yeah. exchange yourself with others and do for them what you would want done for yourself. He said, if you do this, everything will go well. And 
Mm. We all hear in every religion, loving kindness and compassion, love wanting other people to be happy, mm. compassion and wanting other people to be free from suffering. But do you actually think about it every day and say, yeah. I have to integrate these values because my enlightened Lama, who's like the coolest person I've ever met, like funny, loving, wise, yeah. it's like, I want to be like you. This is what he told me to do. So it's like, all right, I'll adopt it as best yeah. I can. And when this climate situation came up and I was reading the science, I went into meditation and I said to my spiritual family, what would you like me to do? Yeah. So I'm listening in meditation, you know, I'm listening carefully and I hear, write a book. Wow. To which I respond, uh -huh. why would anybody want to read a book on the climate by a Lyme doctor? <laughs> to which I hear, no, 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 not just any book on the climate. I want you to write a science fiction climate change novel. <laughs> to which I responded, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I'm hearing this correctly. Yes. <laughs> um, you want me to write a science fiction climate change novel? They said, yes, and make it funny. I said, <laughs> Okay, one last time, you want me to write a comedy, science fiction, climate change novel, that's how you want me to help humanity with this crisis. And the reason, by the way, this came about, and I told you this earlier, yeah, this Lyme patients, the people, the kids were coming into my practice after getting over Lyme, and I said, okay, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah. And they said, I, I said, you're going to college, you're going to get a yeah. job? No. I said, why not? They said, well, the world's going to end. Why would I go to college or get a job? And I thought, all right, this is a one-off like climate grief. And then they started coming in yeah. one after the other. And that's when I realized, okay, you know, the WHO is already saying 10% of the whole world population is depressed, but I was now dealing with mm -hmm. billions of kids yeah. with climate grief who realized the adults weren't paying as much attention. Now, of course, more are. Mm -hmm. um, they were seeing that this was really serious trouble. And why would I bother going to all this effort? Yeah. If there wasn't going to be a world for me to have a job and even have a family. Yeah. So that's when I decided the way I needed to write this book was for the younger generation, but also to write it because I couldn't take the administration four years ago. I'm sorry for anybody who loved that last administration. But so this book is also a political satire and I'm not going to go into too much about it, but it's got scientific solutions for the climate. It describes the problems, the solutions, but it's in a science fiction climate. And it ended up being my alien autobiography, just so you understand that <laughs> in this novel, I am born in the year 2037. We've had alien contact in the year 2035. And for most of you who've watched the government this year, you know they've released the UFO files. For anybody who's been following this, they released the videos from the Navy where they showed these like TikTok things going all over. The, they were like, one foot above the ocean, going as fast as F-18s, all of a sudden going miles away. There was technology with no mm. motor sound. Like, this is not technology that China or Russia or anyone has. The U.S. government was basically saying to everyone, we'd like you to wake up. We're telling you they're here. We're just not going to say it directly. It's kind of an indirect thing, right? But we're going to tell you. And in fact, in Arizona, and you may not know this, but I've spoken to people in Arizona and Sedona, uh, I think it was like two decades ago, over 10,000 people in Phoenix, there was a one mile long UFO over the city of Phoenix that the governor of Arizona uh -huh. reported seeing. And it's like, it wasn't a weather balloon. Wow. It wasn't, you know, it's so, look. So when I wrote this, it's like, I believe that we're not the only species around, but I decided it would be good. I took upon a um, an idea by one of my neighbors, actually, Margaret Doner, who wrote these books on, um, what's called the Orion Wars, that there are these revolutions going on among galaxies. And it's like, oh, great. This is like a starseed thing. I can riff off this. Uh -huh. So I born in the year 2037 and I'm genetically modified. I'm half Jewish, half alien. <laughs> and it's about Prince Ian of Arcturus uh -huh. coming to save the world. He's like born as this person who, after the contact happened where Queen Dawn of Arcturus and my mother is Dawn and my grandmother Helen is, you know, the grand matriarch of Arcturus. I turned my whole family into aliens and some of the peccadillos of my family show up in this book. So my wife, who's kind of like down on my year, 25 years of humor, it's like, you know, you're not that funny after more after 25 years of marriage. She read the book and she went, oh my God, this is like the funniest okay. thing I have read in years. And she heard me when I was upstairs writing this book, I literally downloaded in meditation. Wow. I was like looking at a blank screen because I said, all right, you want me to write this book? Like, you got to help me here. So I looked at a blank screen 
and I listened carefully. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I started seeing pictures and I started hearing names of characters. And over six months, I downloaded a 450 page manuscript wow. and then hired two professional editors because I'd never written a novel. Yeah. And so the book is called Starseed Revolution, R slash evolution. So revolution, evolution. And what I put in the book without giving away too much is I realized three years ago when I was writing this and I was telling you earlier, one of the synchronicities and I get these synchronicities every day, just yesterday, Pope Francis uh -huh. released a video. Um, if you go on my Facebook page, Dr. Period Richard Horowitz, you'll see it. Yeah. He had all the world leaders, Buddhism, Judaism, all the world leaders, including Zoroastrian, uh -huh. come together and say before the COP26 conference that's coming up in Glasgow, this is the greatest existential threat that has ever been faced for humanity. Please, all of our disciples, all of those who follow us, please make the individual changes that you need to make and world leaders plead to what's necessary. Now, I don't want to give away too much, but in the book three years ago, when you read what I wrote in the book, literally every religious leader that was listed wow. was, and I've had these synchronicities coming. So like, when they were downloading this information to yeah. me, I've watched these synchronicities and it's like, it's fun to watch because you never actually know, right. you know, you, you and I both have kind of on our antennas up in the air. Yeah. We work with our right brain gut intuition, Yes. right? And, and when we have a complex medical problem, we've learned our medicine well, yep. we might have five solutions on the left side of our brain, but, yeah. and they may all be good solutions, but ultimately it's the gut heart sense of going yes. into the heart with compassion, listening. Yes. And, and I learned this from Mona Lisa Schultz, who's a psychiatrist, who's an intuitive, a medical intuitive. And I, I did a training with her at Omega and she said, her main thing is gut it, wow. gut it. Wow. Like use your gut to figure out what's going on and using the right and the left brain. And that's kind of what I did with this book is just feeling in what I needed to do. Fortunately, Simon and Schuster picked up the book. Wow. You know, I'm a first time novelist, so this was not obvious this was going to happen. Yeah. And I've made videos, YouTube videos that are on my website starseed-revolution.com yeah, we'll and there's that. three of them up and I, I basically videoed in front of a green screen for four hours and did nine videos on every aspect of the climate. My green screen editor, by the way, said I've won the all-time prize for doing this. Wow. And my <laughs> patients, I sent them out to my patients and it was really interesting getting the response. Some of them said, Dr. H, we had no idea you were this funny. It's like, Really? After all yeah. these years? Yeah. <laughs> Others would say, my ribs are hurting from laughing so hard. Like, oh my God, it's hysterical. And others said, we don't get it. What, what are you doing? It's like, yeah. oh my God, yeah. we don't yeah. get what I'm so oh. it's been really fascinating seeing yeah. the results from my patient population who gets these videos every month. Right. Um, and, like and we just and we just loaded them on TikTok. So now okay. I'm cutting them into three minute segments. And Prince Ian oh, okay. 108 is the TikTok site. I just loaded the first video onto TikTok. I'm going to check this out. So this is um, great. Oh my gosh! So it. it's I'm, I'm having a ball doing this. And the nice thing is, when, before I went to medical school, what's great about this story is, mm -hmm. I was at Northwestern University and I was doing part time theater music and part time pre med. Oh. And I, and I was in like shows, dolphin shows and all these shows at Northwestern. I love theater. I love music. And I said to my mother, you know, mom, I'm thinking of going into theater and music. And she said, you know, Richard, I think it might be best if you become a doctor. She said, why don't you just do theater and music on the side? Uh, and I thought, yeah, I probably can help more people being a doctor than yeah. singing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so now at 60, you know, five years old, I'm basically getting back to roots of like uh -oh. making videos yeah. and yeah. acting and writing scripts. And I'm, I'm just having fun. And what's great about it is this is what my spiritual family said to do. And yeah. yeah, when I, when Simon and Schuster picked up the book, it's being released from pyramided press, which is kind of an off print. Yeah. Nobody was talking about the climate. Oh. When the book finally went live on Amazon about two months ago, uh -huh. One month before is when the UN report came out on the IPCC report, the wow. International Panel on Climate Change saying, oh my God, code red, we're in big trouble. And then yeah. all of a sudden, everyone was talking about the climate. It was like the timing of the book, which it started three years ago, yeah. was exact. Exactly. So 
you know, I love those synchronicities. And, and I love what I love is what you just said too, is like this, your heart was always creative, artistic. You had the right brain. You went into medicine and you actually use that as, to become one of the best Lyme experts in the world. I mean, you taught me a lot of what I know about Lyme disease and I'm grateful, but then what I feel like what the divine is doing is calling. I'm the same. I'm making a documentary right now. I'm writing a book. And so, so such a similar pathway is like, all of a sudden I'm rediscovering the creative side that was the playful bohemian Jill that went into medicine and towed the line. And I, I loved it, right? I love what I do in medicine, but this new side is actually, I think for you and I, potentially more impactful because we're actually probably more aligned with how we really were born to show up in the world. Mm -hmm. um, in that creativity and that joy and that silliness and that not, not just silliness, because this isn't silly, this is a topic, but the joy and the laughter and the, the comedic part of ourselves. Right. I, I could not agree more because some people who don't know me in that sense. And like when I'm doing some of these other things, like Jill, you're really funny. And it's the same thing as like, I must kind of high, you know, I, I like to think I show up authentically, but those parts of ourselves are all the same. They're all, they're all parts and the science served us well. I love the science. I know you do as well, but the way for really impacting the heart is to show up in this way. I love that you're doing it. And I love that you're unapologetically writing a uh, alien autobiography that points people, especially young people, because it's going to take that kind of thing to reach this new generation. Right. Well, and, and by the way, I sent when the book finally released, I mm -hmm. sent a letter to HHS and all of my contacts yeah. because I wanted to warn them in advance yeah. <laughs> that they got the message from me uh -huh. that I just put out a book where yeah. I'm a half alien, half genetically modified Jewish person. Wow. Um, and I've got videos up and stuff. And don't worry, I haven't lost my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it for the climate. Yeah. I'm doing it so that people can have some sense of humor for the most serious problem yeah. Yeah. that has ever really faced humanity. And, and this is the really the greatest test we've ever had for humanity for countries to come together and work together as friends. This is never, you know, it's yeah. never happened in our history. China and the US are gonna have to work together on this one if this is gonna work. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we all, uh, this really, really. So what, what I see, you mentioned this in the beginning, but since a lot of people who listen to both of us are patients and people who deal with chronic disease, let's bring that down to the, we started talking about this, but the, the once we make it relative to the actual person listening, then it starts to make more sense because a lot of this stuff is inconvenient. It's um, make takes a little more time or effort, how, whatever you're doing for your own environment, recycling, climate change, and making the differences, it's not always convenient, right? Um, so what I want to do is make it practical in the sense of, you mentioned uh, ticks and, and how that's affecting and the extinction of things, which is affecting our food supply or honey or almonds and so many other foods. Can you give us a few more practical things of like what people might notice or, or in their lives with climate change? If we don't do something about it, how will it affect disease, our food supply and those kinds of things? That's a great question. So, I mean, first of all, my patients in California have not been able to go out of their house right from months at a time from the wildfires. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, and I know mm -hmm. that small particle pollution, less than 2.5 parts mm -hmm. per million, up your nose, that's called dementia. You get yeah. enough of those things up there with free radical stress. Yep. That's been definitely linked to Alzheimer's dementia. So here's the thing. Now we've got all of these people and they've shown that the COVID cases, right, are much worse yes, with in the, these areas uh, with high pollution. pollution. Exactly. So the pollution that is being released increases in cancer autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, mm -hmm. pulmonary diseases, COVID worsening, right? Yeah. Because we know that for COVID, it's mostly the free radical oxidative stress in the lungs. Yeah. And by the way, the glutathione article, uh, I'll have a couple of stories, I'll just go off. Yeah, please. The glutathione article I published in April, 2020 with Dr. Phyllis Freeman, where we had two cases that got better within an hour mm -hmm. using glutathione. Just two weeks ago, two articles came out back to back they found in both the ICUs and in patients who were sickest from COVID, it was glutathione deficiency looks like it was one of the one common denominators that was showing up. Mm -hmm. And you know, how did I know that for COVID? It's like 30 years of Lyme patients giving right. them glutathione for Herxheimer reactions helped me to help COVID. So think about this. When I was getting out of medical school and residency, and I was getting my Tibetan teachings in Wappinger Falls from Lama Nola Rinpoche, and I said, Lama, my mother wants to open up some place for me in Bayside, Queens to open up a medical practice, but Vassar Hospital would like me to come up and work for them. What do you think? And he did this thing with his mall. It's called a mo. It's a divination. And he goes, oh no, up here, very good. <laughs> think about this one decision 
Wow. That I said, okay, up here in the Hudson Valley, very yeah. good. That one decision to come to the highest Lyme endemic area in the United States, because I was studying with spiritual teachers to try and yeah. right, evolve and be a better person. That's the only reason I was doing Lyme. Now, how did that help COVID? Well, everything I was doing for Lyme, COVID came along. Absolutely. Right, and did it. I want to emphasize that because you and I know we're like, this is no, this is old hat. We've been doing this for 20 years, right? Like when COVID came along, people were frightened. It's new. It's scary. You and I have been doing these kinds of infectious diseases and they all are treated similarly because it's oxidative stress. It's the immune system. It's all that. This is nothing new. Granted, it's a new way. It's wider spread. There's some things about it. Um, how has climate change affected COVID? One of the things you just mentioned was our air supply. I would say 80% of our toxic load is from the air. And like you mentioned, nanoparticles in the air are so profoundly damaging to the brain, the nervous system. When I talk, talked with Dr. Dale Bredesen and taught those courses, some of the first slides I'd put is the um, toxicity of nanoparticulate matter from exhaust and fumes and pollution in our brain. So right on there. Um, how did how did this set the stage for COVID being such a worldwide pandemic? Because it's related. Yeah. So, I mean, we know, we, well, first of all, when you're exposed to toxins, you and I know this, and probably a lot of patients who follow us actually do know this because yeah. they follow functional medicine. When your body has to deal with all those environmental toxins, glutathione is one of the first things yeah. your body has to use to get rid of those toxins, mm -hmm. which are fat soluble to make yeah. them water soluble so you can pee them out of your body. So a lot of these patients that have been exposed to all these environmental toxins, you get exposed to COVID-19, there's 140 times more glutathione in the alveolar lung tissue than any place else in your body. That's why the lungs got affected first when these people were having COVID pneumonia. Yeah. So if you've been in areas and you don't detox and you're not doing what you and I tell our patients mm -hmm. to do every day, which is please take NAC and yeah. alpha-lipoic acid and glutathione and curcumin and broccoli seed extract, right? And yeah. So yeah. When, when our patients are doing this, do you know that I've not lost one patient who died not one in mm -hmm. two years of COVID and only one patient ended up in the hospital on the vent. And fortunately she's now getting off and she's gonna be going home. Um, only one. Mm -hmm. Now that's pretty remarkable considering that we both have large practices and, and these are Lyme patients who've been sick, right? right. With other diseases. Right. So what we've been doing, I think is working. And by the way, the University of California, Irvine, I'm going to be doing a randomized controlled trial for long haulers, it got approved. Yeah. My foundation, the MSIDS Research Foundation approved money. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's going through California. We're gonna be doing 50 long haulers and looking at the MSIDS model Excellent. to look at all the different MSIDS factors in long haulers and giving them a trial of NAC alpha lipoic acid and glutathione. There'll be two groups, one which is gonna get it for two, one for four. And we're going to follow the long hauler symptoms of fatigue and cognitive dysfunction and parosmia and problems with taste and smell and everything else. But it's I have a randomized trial that's actually going to be happening at University of California, Irvine on this. And a lot of this all came mm -hmm. from Lyme, from learning yeah. what goes on. Now, I'll tell you another funny story, and this happened in the last few months. So how did I discover Dapsone for Lyme, right? Mm -hmm. So... I was at Mount Sinai and my infectious disease professor, we had a lot of TB and mycobacterium avium intracellularia with the HIV patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I knew about the drugs, had, was comfortable using them. Ying Zong and then Stanford and mm -hmm. others started saying, hey, these are persister bacteria, but not just they persist, they're persister bacteria is like tuberculosis. Yeah. So I said, ooh, I've been waiting to I use know, mycobacterium right? drugs for years, I got an oh. excuse. Yeah. So I go into meditation and I start looking at the literature. I, Dapsone, 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 wow. anti-malarial, yep. anti-inflammatory, gets up into the brain, mm -hmm. persister drug. I went, oh, this looks good. Yeah. Let's just, since rifampin Dapsone kills leprosy, a persister yeah. drug, let's just add doxycycline to it. Mm -hmm. Is the gut, gut intuition what we're talking yep. about? Yep. And let's try it. It works great. Yep. Then two years later, or actually it's five years later, I do culture studies to prove yeah. what I've been seeing. And the culture is actually showing it that the higher yeah. doses of Dapsone works. Now, fast forward ahead about six months ago, the reason I learned about double dose Dapsone, I, I yeah. told you the story, yeah. one of my patients made a mistake and accidentally took a double dose. I wouldn't have given him that right. dose. You and I as doctors, we've learned to listen to our yeah. patients, right? <laughs> exactly. We learn in medical school, 90% right. of everything you learn comes from your patients listening. Mm -hmm. This one woman, her husband, all of a sudden, she was going into her second month of Dapsone. She got a letter from her husband all of a sudden, he wanted to divorce her. Mm -hmm. She's so upset, 
She yeah. takes a quadruple dose of Dapsone. Oh. <laughs> she calls me four days into the second month and goes, hey, doc, I feel terrible. I've got nausea. I've got vomiting. I feel sick. I said, oh, what are you taking? Oh, you know, I'm taking 200 of Dapsone in the morning, 200 in the evening. I went, oh, no, it's too much. Stop, yeah. stop. Yeah. Fast forward six. I just spoke to her last week. Six yeah. months later, mm -hmm. 15 years sick, not one symptom. She never finished the protocol. She did wow. four days of quadruple Dapsone. Wow. What am I now? So the ongoing study I now have in my yeah. practice because God, Buddhist, Christ, whoever you want to say is feeding me this yeah. stuff, yeah. whispering into their brains, make a mistake. Horowitz will notice. It's like <laughs> I've now have patients on disulfiram uh -huh. with four days of quadruple dapsone. That's it. Wow. Knocking the friggin' infection out of their body. I just spoke to someone in Europe. Yeah. I just spoke to someone in the Midwest mm -hmm. who are having remarkable results. Now I'm I'm in the middle of doing this trial. So anyone listening, please don't go just run to do this. Uh, don't, yes, if you're listening at home, just like the uh, the, the videos where people jump off roofs and right. do silly, yeah, don't do this <laughs> no. yet. I have the protocol, it's all typed up, but I'll be publishing it early next year. So far, what I've seen mm -hmm. is I actually suspect the future protocols for Lyme patients is gonna be pulsed yeah. It's the, yeah. what it showed in the culture studies I published earlier is that the higher the dose of Dapsone, the better. It looks like 400 milligrams is working better than 200 and I'm only giving it for four days. Wow. Wow. So I need more methylene blue to keep down the methemoglobin. Yeah. I need more glutathione to keep, but it's working. Yeah. Now I'll know in three months what I've got, mm -hmm. but the universe simply going back to how can I help? How can I be a benefit? Yeah. How can I use compassion? Put yourself in people's shoes. Yeah. What's happening is it's being handed to me. Wow. It's like the synchronicities are just showing up where the universe is giving me what I need to help other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an amazing process if I go back in my life and I look at this. So, mm -hmm. you know, so even the solutions for the climate, going back to your question, yes. I built a 26 foot geodesic greenhouse from growing spaces in Colorado because I'm so concerned about the food supply. Yeah, the food supply is going to be affected. Mm -hmm. You're going to see next year, my wife, who's a master astrologer, and I don't want to go into the details with Pluto and everything happening, but they're predicting way worse floods and droughts and flooding that are going to be happening even next year because yeah. we have not mitigated what's going on. Right. So you can expect disruptions right now, just like you can go to Home Depot, but things are off the shelves. You couldn't get toilet. Yeah. There's going to be disruptions in the food supply. Mm -hmm. You need to start thinking about where mm -hmm. your food's coming from, stocking yeah. up. You need to start thinking about the power going out, mm -hmm. having backup generators and yeah. stuff like they didn't have in New Orleans, right? right? So we're going to have to start thinking about then even communities coming together yeah. in certain parts where I may have a skill set that you don't have yeah. and they're going to be working more in communities. The world is going to be changing. Climate refugees, this climate migration is already happening, and it's going to be happening in the U.S. because as the water supply goes down in Arizona, California, and the Midwest, and some of this gets worse with wildfires, you're going to see climate migration to the Northeast, to the to other parts of the U.S., apart from Europe and all the places this are happening. Right. So we're going to talk about medical costs going up. By the way, when the permafrost, which is no longer permanently frozen, that's why they call it permafrost, about 15 years ago, they called it the doomsday box. They had it in Norway, it, the doomsday vault. They had every seed for every plant and flower on the planet mm -hmm. in Norway on the permafrost in this permanently frozen yeah. ground. And because of climate change, it melted and it destroyed the seeds. Oh, unbelievable. What in Russia life. now, they're expecting that 40% of all the homes that are built on permafrost, their foundations are going. Wow. So that actually mm -hmm. russia is going to be able to move because the ice in the baltic sea is going to be completely mm -hmm. changing so what's okay. happening is the structures are changing all over the world and it's going to keep changing yeah. but there are bacteria and viruses that are in the permafrost that humanity has never been exposed to for millions of years so everybody just freaked out with covid 19. Yeah. when the permafrost melts there yeah. are bacteria and viruses in that permafrost that we have no immunity. This is COVID-19 a hundred times over. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's so funny because I was going to ask you about those and that's because that's so relevant. Again, to our patients who know what it's like to be sick in this, this is a big deal. It affects, and then you mentioned something that 
Um, I have a brilliant environmentalist friend, Dave, who talked about the uh, escalation to extinction where these uh, uh, plants and well, animals especially are trying to find, maybe they're losing because of the drought their food sources and they're going to higher climates, but then they die off because they can't survive in that climate. So that's part of the extinction you're talking about. And then that affects our food supply because a lot of these like bees, honey bees, or some of these have an effect on the plants and animal kingdom and our food supply. It just really, really, I think many people are in their little bubble of convenience and they're not really thinking about the world um, and how it's going to change if we don't start changing our behaviors. And, you know, I'm, I'm so happy, Pope, you know, from my perspective, I mean, some of the popes before have been wonderful, but Pope Francis, for me, this mm -hmm. guy is stellar. Yeah. I love him. Mm -hmm. It's like he comes from the heart. He's got yeah. wisdom. He's got heart to pull all the world leaders together to tell yeah. people, listen, we have to do it. So, for example, I just renovated my 1860s mm -hmm. barn. I had put in solar panels. I am mm -hmm. now not essentially off the grid, yeah. but I am completely funding all the electric and heat and cooling in that barn wow. by solar. Mm -hmm. I have solar panels on my house. Mm -hmm. I have an electric car. Mm -hmm. I have a greenhouse, mm -hmm. right? So I'm starting to plant every year fruit yeah. trees and blueberries and blood. Yeah. People, I'm just like, this is not to freak people out, but you need to understand what is happening. Yeah. And that, especially if you have kids and you're looking at future generations, mm -hmm. you've got to start preparing. And I tell people on Facebook, they're probably sick of me listening, you know, telling them this, you've got to contract your congressional members and yeah. tell them, especially if you're in a, in a red state, the climate is affecting everyone. Yeah. It, you have got to vote for climate legislation. Whatever your differences are, you have cop to come together on this one because it's affecting everyone. And America's security about 10 years ago, NASA and the army came up with a document and actually showed in 20 years, if we don't do anything, homeland security is at risk. Now, you know, in the United States, if you see something, say something. Yeah. I'm saying something. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying something that the military and NASA has said, which is, our electrical grids are not prepared for what is coming with the storms, yeah. with the melting of roadways from the heat, right? We've had in Arizona 125 degree heat. Planes cannot take off over 124 degrees, yeah. right? So you, you're dealing with a really difficult situation and everybody thinks, oh, come on, it, yeah. it's like this, but it could never get worse. We are in the middle and the very beginning stages of our sixth extinction. We've yeah. had five before. This is not a joke. This is a real crisis for humanity. Everyone should at this point be figuring out what can I do, whether it's a tree planting campaign, putting up solar panels on your house, getting solar from the communities that feed you, right? There's, there's many ways, eat less meat, right? Mm -hmm. To start with, there's many things you can start to do, but you need to start to get educated. And on my website, starseed-revolution.com, I've got the problems, I, and by the way, there are solutions. This is not like this is a hopeless situation. Right, right. It, we have to take a little effort on all, everybody's part. <laughs> there are definitely solutions, yeah. including one of the things I need thinks needs to be done is giving a legal definition of ecocide, uh -huh. which is the destruction of the planet. Mm -hmm. So if we have a legal definition of ecocide, that means any world leader, whether it's Bolsonaro, whoever it is, if you now, right now, and you may know this, the Amazon, which has been a carbon sink, absorbing all this carbon because of now all the wildfires, for the first time in world history, the Amazon in parts is now releasing more carbon wow. than it's absorbing. Mm -hmm. Now, the Amazon is called the lungs of the earth. Mm -hmm. It is a very bad sign. Wow, yeah. That's so we need, we, we've killed and killed off and cut down three trillion trees from six trillion to three in the last century trees store we need it's going to take 30 years to do this but we need different trees of different varieties mm -hmm. to store the carbon dioxide apart from like mangroves and kelp forests there are many if if you go on my website it talks about carbon brief project drawdown there are all these organizations they mm -hmm. have solutions and, and even Stanford published an article by Mark Jacobson a couple of years back in the journal One Earth. He laid out a map for 139 countries how they can get on WWS, wind, water, solar, mm -hmm. and completely get off fossil fuels while saving money, yeah. improving the economies, creating new jobs, yeah. improving health. Stanford already has it. It's already published mm -hmm. in the literature. So there's no reason for people to lose hope. 
Right. But just right. like Greta Thunberg and other people, we may need to strike for the planet and we may need to do it sooner than later. If the world leaders do not take action, and I'm not suggesting yet, but Bill McKibben has called upon people to strike, so has Greta. We may need world strikes, peaceful strikes, one day a week. Everything shuts down in the world. You're not going to work. It shuts down and the economies are going to plummet and the world leaders are going to look. And if they don't do anything months or a year from now, it's two days a week until the world leaders do something. Mm -hmm. And I think the women, by the way, are going to be the ones who are going to lead the charge mm -hmm. right now. I don't mean to be bad to men on this, but we've the ones who screwed it up. We need <laughs> feminine based wisdom. And mm -hmm. my book, Starseed Revolution, the whole premise of the book, as you'll see when you read it is, Folks, it's feminine heart-based wisdom. If you don't yeah. come from the heart and you don't care for this planet and all the beauty and the Garden of Eden that we have here, you're going to destroy it. And literally, there will be places on this planet that will be uninhabitable. And if we get, if you be clear, if we get to even two degrees centigrade, the earth is going to be 70, 80 feet high. The Dover Cliffs in England, which are over 400 feet, yeah. that's what it was like in the last you know, mm -hmm. 60 million years ago when we had this last extinction. So if you think that a good part of the planet cannot be destroyed, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's coming in the next 70 years. And the climate models, my concern with it is there are tipping points. Mm -hmm. If the AMOC slows down too much, it's a tipping point. Yeah. The Arctic is now two to three times warmer than other places on the planet. So one of the solutions I have on the website, and, mm -hmm. and the reason I want people to buy the book is not because... I need the money at this point. So you go buy my book on Amazon. I need to make it to number one in the New York Times bestseller or national bestseller because I need to have a voice in the climate dialogue because when you listen to people talk about the climate, do they talk about tick-borne and Lyme? They yeah. do not. No. Do they talk about environmental toxins no. and what's happening? A little bit, but really not that much. And do they talk about geoengineering? Mm -hmm. Well, right now we're gonna be carbon neutral in 2050. By 2050, folks, it's way too late. Yeah. If you do geoengineering, two major methods. Mm -hmm. The last time the Philippines had a volcano in 1991, it cooled the planet by a half a degree centigrade for many years. Mm -hmm. If you take airplanes in the stratosphere at 60,000 feet above Greenland and Antarctica, mm -hmm. and you put sulfates, which is essentially what comes out from volcanoes, you can lower the sun coming through and cool the permafrost to mm -hmm. stop it from melting. Because if you don't, the permafrost contains twice as much carbon dioxide and methane as is anywhere on the planet. Oh, wow. Methane has a warming effect 30 to 80 times more than carbon dioxide. Yeah. So right now, from my perspective, and by the way, this is the intuitive part coming through. My spiritual teachers are yelling to me, geoengineering, geoengineering, you've got to buy time to get off fossil fuels. So I need a voice mm -hmm. in the climate dialogue. And I think people are going to really love the book. They're going to laugh. Yeah. They're going to learn about the climate in a funny way. In a fun way, and yeah. And one thing I put in the book, which I have to actually, I think I have permission from my spiritual teachers, but I I sent a message to his eminence, Sita Rinpoche, who's in India. He's one of the heads of the Kagyu lineage. Yeah. A hundred years ago in Tibet, my wife and I took a course, it's called Mahamudra meditation. Mm -hmm. It's one of the highest forms of meditation in the Kagyu lineage. And what this is, is it's a quick form of meditation to wake up, mm -hmm. okay? now. The way the story goes is in the 1950s in Tibet, there was a Lama by the name of Kempo Gangsha Rinpoche. He was in Tibet looking at the mountains in Tibet. He was in his monastery in February, looking out the window and looking at the, the mountain peaks and the snow in Tibet. And he noticed the mountain peaks were melting. Mm. This was probably an early sign of climate. And he, he knew it was an inauspicious sign, like something bad was happening. And because he was a great Lama, he knew China was about to invade. Mm -hmm. He passed out on the floor. He had a heart attack and died mm. from his compassion being so great, realizing the suffering that people were going to have. Mm -hmm. The way the story goes, there was a crow, a raven, that all of a sudden appeared on the window of the monastery floor. He walks over. He kind of jumps over to Kempo Gangsha Rinpoche. He pecks on the top of his head where the energy channels are. And all of a sudden, Kempo Gangsha wakes up and he's completely enlightened. Wow. 
And Kempo Gongshar then goes around to bed. He's naked, by the way, the way the story goes. There's some actually very funny stories on this. He teaches naked. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he's a, he's a crazy yogi. But he teaches this form of meditation. And you may know Chugyam Trungpa. You may have heard of Chugyam Trungpa Rinpoche, um, which was Pema Chodron's teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pema Chodron. So, so, so Kempo, this Kempo taught Chugyam Trungpa Rinpoche, but he also taught the teacher who taught us, which is the very venerable Tronga Rinpoche. So Tronga Rinpoche was in Tibet mm -hmm. at that time, getting the teachings with Tronga Rinpoche. Um, with Ke and he basically transmitted it to a hundred people in Maine over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now I'm an extensive note taker. Yeah. I have volumes of notes this big and I put the instructions in the book. Wow. And I did it because these instructions were given in Tibet at times of great danger. Mm -hmm when people needed their minds stabilized yeah. because they didn't have time to do a three year, three month, three year retreat to, to become enlightened. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, reading what was going on in the climate, you know something? The young kids, if God forbid the worst case scenario should happen, mm -hmm. I need to give these teachings mm -hmm. to the world. Now, Cedar Rinpoche about 18 years ago told me, I said, what do you think if I wrote a Dharma book? Yeah. And he said, oh, very good, you write Dharma book. Now he didn't say comedy science fiction book with Dharma teachings right. in it, that he did not say. <laughs> I'm assuming- to find a way to uh, And I, I didn't love. think if I wrote a meditation book that yeah. it's like, okay, who's gonna read? But I thought like, if I put these meditation instructions in the book, yeah. that people would do it. Now, when you go to my website and you read the solutions under climate, the 1% global climate solution, I actually have a plan and I'm just gonna let you know, I need 80 million people across the world to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a meditation technique, which is based on these Mahamudra teachings and the teachings I received by the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali when I did the TM City technique 45 years ago in Brussels when they mm -hmm. were doing yogic flying. What I learned is with the power of the mind that if the mind is in a very calm state and you introduce a thought, these specific mm -hmm. Yoga Sutras, it will actually cause physical reality to change. And Harvard, Harvard Benson from Harvard did scientific studies that were published in the literature when they had these groups of people in Israel yeah. and Lebanon mm -hmm. and in Washington, DC, they had groups of meditators doing this technique and the square root of 1% of the population when they did it, war went down, death went down, health got better, mm -hmm. the economy, like all of a sudden these sociological changes and there was no other explanation. Mm -hmm. So what I did in the book and on the website is I basically given the technique, but since I don't think people will learn the yogic flying the way it was taught to me, I figured it, it's not gonna be square root of 1%. I may need 1% of the global population, which is 8 yeah. billion people, 80 million. So if I can find 80 million young people to do this meditation for five or 10 minutes a day, this is going to be the wildest way from my, from everything I've learned uh -huh. to try and save the world, which is instead of working it from the outside, work it from the inside to actually change physical reality. Now I have no idea whether this will wow. actually work, but it actually is based on hard science. Yeah. Yeah. It's based yeah. on very profound meditation teachings. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me today for my interview on climate change with Dr. Richard Horowitz. Um, I hope you enjoyed that tour de force um, of all things creative and probably a side of Dr. Horowitz that you have never seen before. Super excited for his book to come out. If you wanna find more information about that, you can go to the starseed-revolution.com. He also has a, a Facebook page, Starseed Revolution Book, and you can find his information there. Um, as always, you can find all of my podcasts on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and more episodes coming out every week. If you are interested in any binders or products that we mentioned on the show, you can visit drjillhealth.com and find all of my favorite products and, and information about those there. Things like the coffee enema kit for detox and the mold detox box and some of my favorite binders and vitamins and all those things. So that's at drjillhealth.com. Dot com. And of course, all kinds of, of decades of free resources on my website, jillcarnahan.com, the free blog. You can sign up for my newsletter. So many great resources there. I do it just because I love putting out great information for you. So thanks again for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next interview. Have a great day.